Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for your patience. The uh, fault for Professor Stain's late arrival was almost entirely mine, and, and, and I apologise uh, profusely. Uh, I'm pleased so many of you uh, remain to hear what Professor Stone has to, to say. Um, it's a pleasure to see many old friends, and a particular and um, and a particular pleasure to introduce uh, Norman. A mutual friend of ours described him as the least boring person he had ever met, and I think you'll agree that he's fully lived up to expectations this evening. <laughs> um, just a brief word about the Danube Institute. It, it exists to promote engagement uh, between those of differing views in Central Europe. We think there's too little of that. Uh, we also seek to draw attention to trends and developments outside this region which are likely to have far-reaching effects or, or consequences. And because of its size and its geographical location, what happens in Turkey is likely to have a profound, event, profound effect beyond its borders, which is why we are turning our attention towards that country this evening. This is a topical as well as important subject because uh, President uh, Abdullah Gul has been in Budapest this week and has forecast that trade links between Hungary and his country are likely to grow from two million annually to more than twice that figure in the space of a few years, he says. But the complex interplay of political, cultural and uh, social factors and forces that will shape Turkey's future mean that it may be easier to trade with than to understand. A decade ago, no one was in much doubt about its Western vocation, its desire to join the European Union and to adopt a Western outlook. Critics now complain of Prime Minister Erdogan, um, uh, of the Prime Minister's increasingly autocratic style, and say he has sought to exploit and magnify the divisions within Turkish society for political advantage, while trying to muzzle the press by putting journalists in jail. Economically, Turkey continues to prosper. Now the world's 15th largest economy and Europe's sixth largest economy, it has uh, uh, gleaming blocks of, uh, of hotels and flats, new schools, uh, new hospitals. The country's mix of modern and traditional secular and Islamic leads to the oft-asked question, whither Turkey? We are not the only ones to ask that question. In fact, I googled whither Turkey today and saw at least 50 articles uh, with that uh, uh, heading. Professor Stone, who has worked in Turkey for the last 18 years, that is the author of a short history of Turkey, is well qualified to answer that question. He is one of Britain's best known and most controversial historians, a former Cambridge student, then lecturer at the University of Cambridge, professor of modern history at Oxford, uh, and uh, professor of international relations at the University of Bill Kent in Ankara. He was speechwriter, uh, to the British Conservative Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and is the author of numerous books on 20th century history, including The Eastern Front, 1914-17, Hitler, Europe Transformed, The Other Russia, The Atlantic and Its Enemies, A Personal History of the Cold War. Well, that's only a, a, a very abbreviated list of his, uh, of his published work. Today he, has, uh, he lives in Budapest for at least part of the year, and is currently writing a biography of, of Count Andrashi. Professor Stone's lecture will be followed by a response from Tamash uh, Zigatvari uh, of this university, and there'll be general discussion to which we hope as many of you as possible will contribute, after which we hope you will join us for light refreshment and conversation. Um, I suppose the first question is, can I be heard? I'm all right, good. Um, the second thing I have to offer is a an apology. Thank you very much for waiting. Um, I think if a lecturer turns up this late, it's a nightmare. And <laughs> that is well done. I hope I'll, um, I hope I'll uh, reward your patience. Uh, it was a mix-up of communications, I'm afraid, because I was in Vienna last night, took the train and so on. Anyway, at least said, Sudas mended. Now, next thing since I'm talking about Turkey. Um, uh, Lord Palmerston remarked over some Indian problem that when he wanted to know what not to think about a country, 
he asked somebody who had lived there for 20 years. I've been in Turkey for 20 years. Um, uh, I failed to foresee what was coming up. I'll go into this later. Um, and I'm pretty hesitant about what I have to say. The interesting thing for a historian, and I'm sure Ambassador Yesensky would absolutely understand this, you look to history for the broad outlines of something, but it's not always obvious what the indications for the present are. I'm convinced it's a very good background, very good. If you think how people who call themselves political scientists simply didn't foresee the end of the Soviet Union, I mean, really, whereas I think the historians did, by and large. Um, now, uh, I've been in Turkey since for 20 years. Um, I went there by chance. I was invited to a conference about Bosnia and Croatia, which I'd been writing about energetically, and I was angry. Um, and uh, I didn't know anything about Turkey. I knew that there was Ataturk. I knew there were, that they were all supposed to wear hats. That law is still on the books, by the way, um, and that sort of thing, but didn't know much. And then arrived and found, well, do you know, you arrive in a country, a bit like that in Hungary. Uh, you just like the place. In this case, when I arrived at Istanbul airport, there were six policemen, black uniforms, black moustaches, bunches of keys, all smoking furiously under a sign reading, no smoking. And I thought, ah, it's a serious country. And then, um, and then one night in Ankara, when the rain was pouring down and pitch dark, I had a taxi for not very far. And there was an inflation at that time, and the zeros on the meter went multiplying. And uh, in Aldo, I have to say, since that beastly referendum, with some shame, I'm a Scotsman, uh, I don't care about small sums of money. And uh, gave the man the equivalent of, I suppose, $20 and said, keep the change. He held my hand and counted the change back into it. And I thought, this is a serious place. And, uh, you know, by and large, if you're a foreigner, uh, you get on very well in that country. Um, since I'm in flattering mode, I would say that uh, the Hungarians in Turkey have since the beginning been among the most impressive foreigners. You probably know that the man who designed the gun with which Sultan Mehmet the Conqueror destroyed the walls, of, a breach in the walls of Constantinople, was a Hungarian. There's Hungarians absolutely everywhere. Uh, <coughs> I've been contemplating doing a book about the experience of foreigners in Turkey since 1838. And <coughs> it's interesting you come across, of course, I don't need to tell you this, you come across Hungarians one after another. Uh, <coughs> and you've had absolutely excellent ambassador, <coughs> Janos Hovari, who did a brilliant job. Now, <coughs> uh, so I've had a very easy time. Good students, everything. And I've also watched, uh, in the last 20 years, a very, very steady progress. If you think that Turkey in 1923 was a place where if you wanted to make, a, wanted to have a table, the legs of which didn't wobble, you had to ask an Armenian who knew about treating wood in the right sort of way. Now, you know, Turkey is obviously in many respects an advanced economy. Um, <clears throat> take something standard. I, I know I'm addressing one of the great 
hypochondriacal civilizations of the world, Hungary. Health. Uh, if, well, I've had my experiences, of course, at my age. You go into a Turkish hospital, I must say I'd rather have it than the British National Health Service, which should really be described as the Florence Nightingale Memorial System. <laughs> it's, uh, um, all that sort of thing, you know, works, communications, people, uh, getting through to people. My university, a good case in point is my university. People have been moaning about state universities, especially in Germany, for decades now. The Turks actually set up a private university. I think it's the first in what we might call the European space. It's Bill Kent. It works like a charm. In 25 years, they have built up an extremely serious library. They've, run, they've done awfully well. And that sort of thing I've seen happening in Turkey, and we now have what is obviously a, a pretty serious country. Now, <clears throat> what has gone wrong? We have no... Uh, a situation in which, uh, well, there is a certain standoff between Turkey and the West. I hear from people in NATO officers in casually just conversations that there are problems now over military cooperation with um, the Turkish army, which previously didn't exist. The Turks are making uh, quite serious approaches to Russia, Iran, and uh, which is not something that they would have done before. Uh, I mean, we can take differing views about what's going on in the Ukraine. And if I were in the position of being responsible for Turkish affairs, I would have said that an approach to Russia does make a lot of sense. I mean, after all, it's a pure anomaly that Turkey abandoned her neutral position as regards Russia or Soviet Union in 1950. It's rather an anomaly, and the fact was simply that Stalin had said he wanted the northeastern part of modern Turkey to rejoin Russia. He would probably have set up some sort of greater Azerbaijan in northern Iran. <clears throat> and he would have had bases on the Bosphorus. And uh, it was purely Stalin's megalomania, if you like. Well, no, not that. Because whatever you think of Stalin, he was megalo. Uh, he pushed Turkey into an alliance with the West. And in 1957, Khrushchev ranted at Molotov in a Politburo meeting and said, you made enemies of Iran and Turkey. It's not natural. Nor was it. Turkey's independence in 1921 20, was really based on an alliance with Moscow. Ankara and Moscow in those days understood each other very well. Moscow supported Ankara and uh, the, the relations were very good. In the 1930s, for instance, you were forbidden to read exile literature from the Caucasus. And the deal was done, Azerbaijan, Soviet, Armenia, Turkish. <coughs> That's the basis of it. And for the Soviets, for Moscow to upset that arrangement was, well, crazy. Anyway, Turkey plus NATO, and it's been a hugely positive thing. Let me give you two statistics. I'm not a statistician, don't worry. And I don't do PowerPoints. But I'll give you two statistics. One is that uh, not so long ago, every year into Turkish is translated, are translated, 11,000 works, into Arabic, 300. The Turkish economy is now 
Well, you can't count it. You know, growing economies have better things to do than count themselves. If you want to see the Turkish economy, just go to Eminönü and see the way people work. Uh, but on the statistics, um, the Turkish economy is worth about sort of kind of more than the rest of the Levant and the Middle East put together. Uh, and that's including oil. So something has worked with the NATO connection. <coughs> now, what has gone wrong? I think the first thing is that the, the Europeans have mishandled this situation. They're dealing with uh, a growing country. It's the only one in Europe just about with a really growing population with a GDP per head which is significantly lower than wherever, um, which has nevertheless got 70, 80 million. It's a complicated country. It's past is something to look up to, the Pax Ottomanica and all that. It's strategically vastly important. And what do the Europeans do? Well, I could ask you. Cyprus. Now, to make your relations dependent with Turkey dependent on Greek Cyprus, a pimple is absurd. I mean, it's true that the Greek Cypriots have managed their affairs in terms of public relations much better than the Turks. Um, the Turks are not very good at telling lies. They try, but they're not good at it. The Greeks, comma, on the other hand, comma, are. And, um, so they have persuaded the rest of the world that in, 1960, in 1974, they were performing their bouzouki music, da -da 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 -da, dancing around their maypoles, quite innocently practicing their native customs, when suddenly a, a, a Turkish army shot out of the air and took the northern third of the island. That is not how every journalist in the world saw it in 1963. Now, you could argue that, look, I'm not going to talk about Cyprus, this would be absurd. But for the Europeans to have recognized Cyprus as part of the European Union without sorting out the problem with the North. Um, uh, there is a line in English literature which I very much like when Boswell asked Dr. Johnson, what do you think of the plot of Shakespeare's Cymbeline? And Johnson said, sir, it is impossible to criticize unresisting imbecility. That is all one can say about European policy about Cyprus. And <laughs> there was a bizarre revenge. You remember when the last Greek crisis came up, about three, um, all the Europeans got together, made solemn expressions, and said, mm, we will help Greece. There was one country in Europe which said, we're not going to help Greece, Greek Cyprus. <laughs> uh, you know, to try to stop the Turkish association with Europe on the, with silly arguments about Greek Cyprus, come off it, come off it. Uh, absurd. There's something more which is actually more important for ordinary Turks and that is uh, the European visa business. The Americans are straightforward about it. They say uh, educated Turks, uh, uh, let them in, give them a 10-year visa, no problem. Uh, the Europeans have the absurd idea that everybody has to be treated the same. Therefore, they say, elderly professors of archaeology invited to the Netherlands for a conference get a three-day visa. Um, you know, this, is, this sort of thing is indefensible, and it makes the Europeans very unpopular 
with ordinary Turks for obvious reasons. Why we have to insist that everybody's the same, it's just not true. Um, anyway, this is one of the things the Europeans have simply got wrong, and it's their fault. Um, their performance has been deplorable <coughs> over this sort of thing. So it's not surprising that there is a head steam in Turkey of people thinking, hmm, these people aren't our friends. Now that allows me to come to a, a rather more um, delicate matter, uh, which is the particular position of the Turks in Germany. In Turks in Hungary, as far as I can see, don't have any problem at all. They, it's, it's, it's an old relationship. I know I'm in a Catholic university, but I would have to say Hungarian Protestantism survived because of the Turks. Um, if it had been up to, I'll tease you, if it had been up to the Catholics, you'd all have been speaking German. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a problem. But there is a problem with Turks in Germany, and that is, after all, three million. How do we explain it? Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the book of, what was he called, Sarazin, Deutschland schafft sich ab, which is a very melancholy account of a tense relationship. I mean, it's obviously getting better now. Uh, my background to this is that um, the Germans are not very good at immigration. Uh, you know, a German historian, Karl Ulrich Wehler, wrote uh, an article uh, criticizing, well, uh, saying that the, uh, the Poles in Germany took five generations to, to assimilate. You know, they arrive in Bochum, um, and then next generation down, they've got um, their own churches, their own trade unions, their own everything, still speaking with a Polish accent. Third generation, the same thing. Fourth generation, the same thing. Fifth generation, Politburo of the DDR and Hamburg football team. Um, and maybe it's something specifically German, but there is a problem there. And uh, uh, what one does about it, um, God knows. The, uh, I would have to say, I think the Germans are the only ones who have this sort of problem. Um, of course, it exists in other countries, but not anything like the same extent. It is uh, maybe a German problem. Anyway, there we are. That is the, the way the Europeans treat Turkey, I think, is inviting trouble. And um, in due course, we get a, a, a political movement in Turkey which stands up and says, well, look, uh, we have our own traditions uh, and we latch on to a tradition which goes back to, well, before Abdul Hamid in 1876, where uh, oh, any Muslim, whether it's in British India or the Ottoman Empire, Egypt, would say, why are we being defeated by the West? Now, uh, anybody who thinks is bound to connect with the national religion, especially with something like uh, Islam, which is a political religion. <coughs> and they asked themselves this question, and the dominant theme was always Al-Afghani. We taught these people science. Whether it's true or not doesn't matter. Um, then we forgot the science. They've got it. We'll learn it from them. But we don't need to learn anything else. And if by uh, the process that I've lived through, you actually can learn, you become tolerably prosperous, uh, you begin to think, well, uh, we will, we are actually, we have done it. 
we've done the trick. We are an Islamic country which has turned the corner, which has done what uh, Rousteau said in the 1960s. You remember the takeoff into sustained growth. Um, we've actually done it. And for a country which, go back to my wobbling table, had been thinking the West is superior, no, they've got other ideas. And if you look at what has been proposed in the last two or three years, uh, there is, um, there is <coughs> uh, one extraordinary comment which came out of the protests in Istanbul two years ago, a year and a half ago, when I think it was the minister, deputy minister of something or other said, this has all been got up by the Rothschilds in order to stop Turkey from having a spaceship. Now, I, <laughs> uh, I'm very fond of Turkey, but there are times when approval needs to be withheld. And <laughs> now, what was behind this is this. They're going to build a third airport in Istanbul. Uh, it'll be very large. Next to it, there'll be a huge canal which will take the weight off the Bosphorus trade, which is already was 25 huge tankers every day. All right. Then they said, we'll have a medical center, medical research center. And we'll also have our own, very own space center, space research. Now, why are they doing this? It's not uh, to copy the West. It's to say to the people in Iran, who put a monkey into space, remember, the one that looked like Amin Jabad, what was his name? Um, that would really annoy somebody like President Erdogan, who's a keen Sunni. The idea that a Shia president would be able to send a monkey into space before the Sunni, mm -hmm. forget it. So we have a Turkish space center. Now it's not, uh, you know, it's, I, I know, I mean, I know the quality of my students. They're perfectly capable of doing this sort of thing. So Turkey has uh, done really um, astonishingly well. And it's maybe not surprising that there is one political group in the whole place which actually stands together and which says political Islam. Now, like, I think all the foreigners I know, except one, uh, were in favor of it when it started. Uh, I'd been there for seven or eight years, didn't, I mean, I don't count myself an expert, but we had lived through political chaos well, not chaos, but it was silly politics. <coughs> uh, we had seen a currency which had 20 million on a note, 50 even, um, which obviously caused foreigners to giggle and Turks to feel ashamed. Um, we had seen, you know, the, well, in Istanbul, they, they tolerate dogs because they control cats who control rats, and that was rubbish collection. And, you know, uh, the, the place seemed to need a good government. Was it getting one? No. And along comes political Islam. President Erdogan had been a very efficient mayor of Istanbul. My rubbish in Istanbul when I had a flat there, was collected twice a day. In England, it's collected twice a month, thank you. Um, I could see things getting better and better in Istanbul, and people obviously responded to that. The other parties couldn't get their act together. And eventually, political Islam came up, and uh, you know, all the foreigners, and Quite a number of my students who are not in any way politically Islamic 
said, let's give them a chance. And in the first years, it went very well indeed. It would have to be said. They, um, you, know, you could see the country in very serious hands. Uh, I, mean, I, I had good relations with, uh, in fact, still write for a historical periodical, which tends to stress the good sides of the Ottoman Empire. I don't mind writing for them because I can see what uh, uh, one's just an honest man. And, uh, <coughs> um, and then something seems to go wrong. 2011. Um, uh, and I think the biggest thing is Syria. Not too much had gone wrong. The government was criticised, but still, if ordinary people wanted housing or they wanted health, they got it. Even in distant provinces. If you go into provincial Anatolia now, you will see even places like Kars, which I had seen in 1998, when it was dirt poor, desperately poor. Even Kars now has, I won't say prosperity, but it works. Little, well, other places like Erzinjan uh, work quite well. There are areas of Western Anatolia, Eskisheir, although it's not in government hands, which are just like Dutch provincial towns, Amersfoort or something like that. That's been the basis of something very considerable. And now comes Syria. I suppose the end of Turkish progressive regimes tends to come from Syria, as it did for poor old Mahmoud II in the 1830s. Um, <coughs> uh, the complications come from that area. Mixed, the Sunni Shia divide, insofar as the Sunni thing is a block, which it isn't. And now, um, the, I think the success of this government went to its head. And they thought, we can simply snap our fingers, and these ridiculous people in the Middle East will recognize our superiority. And they have tried with Bashar Assad, and I'm afraid went far too far. Assad has not collapsed. The Iranians and the, and the Russians supported him. He's obviously supported by a substantial number of people in Syria. So he has not collapsed at all. And what Turkey's got is two million refugees. Nowadays, I'm afraid it's very, very depressing to wander around Istanbul because you're asked by Syrian beggars at every street corner, more or less. Yeah. Um, uh, what can be done with this? God alone knows. The source of instability from that is colossal. And the other side of it is that there's a lot of Arab money coming into Turkey. Uh, in Istanbul in the old days, you never saw the hijabs, of almost never. Chadors. Now you see an awful lot of them, and the Arabs are buying up areas of on the in Yalova, which can only be very worrying if you think what is the future of this country. Now I'll end up, because um, I should end up, Jerry. I think I've probably talked too long, haven't I? All right. <coughs> I'll end up with um, the other big uh, problem, which is the Kurds. Um, again, this government gets uh, good, uh, good publicity for making an effort to deal with the Kurds. Uh, it should be said, I think, that the, the brightest idea about this was the original national pact um, when the Republic was set up, which said that the Turkey should include Mosul because Turks and Kurds are closer than anything else. There's a huge amount of intermarriage, a 
a huge amount of closeness. And I think any honest Kurd would admit that they've been so divided for so long that making a Kurdistan actually work would be very, very difficult indeed. And uh, so it is. Now, <clears throat> this government has made an approach to the Kurds, and certainly the atmosphere is, well, on the official level, is much easier. But on the other hand, this question divides the Turks very badly. And there might be a minefield blow up under that. Um, it's, uh, I have no idea what the future is on this one. Obviously, from the point of view of us, to have a functioning independent Kurdistan would be a good idea. But on the ground, it would mean people with, who have lived next to Arabs have to cooperate with people who have lived next to Turks. There are differences of language quite apart from political tradition. There's the presence of Shafi Islam in large parts of the Kurdish world. I don't want to set myself up as an expert, but this is again something which would be terribly difficult to deal with. And, uh, well, uh, a final word. Where do you go in Turkish history for your Ariadne thread? that might help to explain this. And I think in the end it's Abdul Hamid. Here was a spirited effort at Islamic modernization of the Ottoman Empire. He set up the first business school, which is now the rector's building of Marmara University. Abdul Hamid went on for 20, we should now say, authoritarian years. He wasn't that authoritarian. Uh, the Turkish death penalty, for instance, executed fewer people in a year than the Third Republic executed in a day, <clears throat> or probably the, than the British Empire in a minute. And <clears throat> not that authoritarian, but he brings up a new generation, 1908, 1909 happen, the Young Turks, the setting up of the country. And I think this government is in the tradition of Abdul Hamid. And we'll see what happens. But we've got problems ahead. Thank you. Thank you. It's quite late, so I would like to make some short remarks only, or uh, maybe some thoughts uh, uh, add to the uh, presentation of Professor Stone I enjoyed very much. Uh, the first one, I. Uh, the well, will be question I would raise whether, yes, there was quite a lot of changes in Turkey politically and economically, and t Turkey uh, seems to become a really successful and, and uh, fast-growing country. Uh, the first question would be whether Turkey can be a model for countries in the region, especially after the Arab Spring. Can Turkey be a model for, for the countries like Egypt or Tunisia, how to be a kind of Muslim democracy? if there is uh, any such things. I think I have doubts, partly due to the specific history of Turkey. Turkey, for seven decades, tried to Europeanize its uh, society, and it has quite, have, uh, worked quite a lot to be a Western society, while if we compare it with Arab countries, uh, uh, they have quite uh, other experiences. So from that side, I have doubts. On the economic side, uh, I would like to uh, uh, remember you on, the, on, the, uh, uh, on uh, one uh, quote from Turgut Özal, late uh, Prime Minister of Turkey, he said that it's a lot for Turkey that they have no oil because they have to work for money. And if we compare it with neighboring Arab countries or Iran, of course, tu yes, Turkey has, has no such, luck, such income, so they have to really hard, work hard. And some says as well that if we compare it with, with the, the rise of capitalism, the protest and how it was, can support of the success of capitalism was, uh, can we, we trace back to, to the Protestant ethics. In Turkey, we can see a kind of Muslim ethics. So the Anatolian tigers, these, uh, uh, well, uh, not religious based, but this middle class based, uh, uh, very successful uh, uh, companies, they are really working hard and the success and competitiveness of Turkey is very much, we can uh, uh, 
trace back to this, this uh, really changing uh, society and uh, changing, uh, well, uh, uh, well, ethics to work, which is, uh, uh, well, quite different from uh, neighboring countries in, in many ways. One other, yeah, uh, remark maybe to, to the, the Euro EU uh, or European uh, relations with Turkey. I think uh, Europe has realized that they have to change the approach because, uh, well, the bureaucratic approach is that uh, Turkey is an, uh, an accession country, we have the enlargement process, but the problem with enlargement is that it's a kind of teacher-pupil relation. We say you what you have to do, and you have to do the... But I think Turkey also realized that he, he's another case. Maybe in the early two, years of 2000, when the process started, or before it started, the situation was different. Europe was an attracting uh, power with, with quite a lot of economic and political successes, while Turkey was just after a huge crisis. So at that time, and, and, and after seven decades of, of uh, 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 devote for Europe, so from the beginning, Turkey wanted to be a European country, and they uh, have uh, done everything to be European. But situation changed both the Turkish politics and, and the attraction of Europe, and we may say that today, Turkey realized that th so they want a different kind of of relation with Europe, not that uh, teacher-pupil type of relation. And I think Europe also realized that they need Turkey and they have to have another kind of approach. Maybe in the last years they started a so-called positive agenda with issues where they have a mutual interest. Foreign policy, so both want to have some solution in the Middle East and Turkey is a, a quite important uh, actor, although we have heard in the uh, uh, lecture that it's uh, not always clear the position of Turkey. Another thing is energy. Turkey be is becoming now a hub, an energy hub, and more, more and more important for Europe. So Europe has to realize that, yes, if they want to keep Turkey, they have to have a different approach to Turkey. So that uh, would be another uh, issue. And maybe, I, I think Turkey, uh, real so uh, Turkey wants to be a kind of bridge between West and the uh, East. Turkey, Turks always, uh, well, uh, uh, thinks that they, they can be a bridge because they understand the Western uh, 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 way of thinking. On the same time, they understand also the Eastern way of thinking. So they are a kind of, of, of natural uh, bridge between the two cultures. As the, and the Bosporus, they are connecting Europe and Asia. Also culturally and, and in, in many sense, they, they may be a kind of a connection between, the, between Europe and, and the Middle East. So uh, maybe that may be a, an approach for Europe as well, to accept Turkey as something different, but very important uh, country in the region that may connect us uh, with, with other types of culture. And we have to realize that our Western types of uh, thinking is maybe not the, the single way uh, of uh, thinking. Thank you, and I think uh, I will give the floor for questions. Hard to welcome, Norman, and we are very happy that uh, with some patience uh, we were able to listen to your talk. And, uh, well, you gave some answers, but I think uh, you made more questions. and. Uh, well, Turkey is such an important country now, as we all know, and uh, this audience uh, uh, reflects that, that it is understandable that uh, you could not answer all the issues which uh, are in our mind. Uh, I will raise two, perhaps additional ones, which you haven't tackled really very much. One is what uh, happens, to, in your view, uh, to the heritage of Kemal. Can we say that, uh, well, the present uh, government, the present uh, uh, well, half Muslim attitude is pay, still paying lip service to uh, Kemal, but in fact uh, abandoning it. So do you think that uh, they will make a clear break with this? After all, the party which uh, followed Kemal and uh, still tried it, they are unlikely to come back to power. So one is, uh, is Kemalism, and Kemalism was also Europeanism. So what is your opinion about that? The other is uh, pan-Turkish or pan-Turkic uh, questions. After all, what interests many Hungarians, uh, not least the late Prime Minister Antal, uh, is uh, how Turkey can, can, can somehow bring up uh, a new alliance, uh, how, how Turkey can become a more important power, more important than it is today, by uh, aligning itself uh, to Azerbaijan and to all these uh, Turkic uh, Central Asian countries. So how do you think? Well, of course, we speak about, we hear a lot about uh, uh, new Ottoman uh, attitude. Well, 
Turkey has, in fact, uh, two possible kind of uh, approaches. Uh, uh, and one approach uh, to the Arab world, uh, to be even a leader of uh, the Muslim world uh, in a more kind of acceptable way to Europeans. But the other is uh, uh, even more nationalistic uh, Turkey leading all these Turkic people. So two, I think, also important questions worth considering. Well, well. <laughs> good ones. Uh, I, I, can I be heard all right? Yes. Good. Um, I, and I, I, let's take the second one first, all this business about um, the Turkic peoples. I think that's just romantic, you know. Um, Turkish businessmen were all over Kazakhstan and whatnot. Uh, I don't think they got very far. And it's, it's, it's always been kind of romanticism. And when Enver Pasha charged off into Central Asia after the Russian Revolution, uh, he would arrive in places. And I mean, you know, he appeared at the, the Congress of the uh, Toilers of the East in Baku as representative of the proletariat of Libya. Um, when he turned up in Kyrgyzstan, in Kyrgyzia, uh, he was met by members of the Arzmendi Tarikat, who opened his suitcase, found photographs of his wife and children, the wife being the niece of the Sultan, tore them up and said, <coughs> Islam photographs not allowed. Um, I, I think, I, I think it's, it's romanticism, this. Uh, so uh, the, uh, let, let's leave it alone. Um, the whether Kemal will survive, um, the, the, I would have guessed yes, because it stands for, look, anybody going to Turkey finds it extraordinary. There are big displays of a leader who is, after all, 100 years old. Um, but the, tr the thing is, it has become a sort of code, um, especially for women. You know, you'll find women school teachers who will say, if it hadn't been for that man, I would not have been where I am. And uh, that in a country like that, uh, women are n not employed as much as here, is something to do with the Ataturk reforms. And, you know, with a critical mass of people like that, it's going to be very difficult to get rid of it. Um, I mean, I think it's true that President Erdogan really does fancy himself as a new Ataturk. He's, uh, I mean, he's built this huge palace in Ankara with 1,200 rooms in it. And I think what, what that's for is that he will be the new caliph and representatives from all the Muslims will come and each have a room in this huge thing in Ankara. And then he's got the idea of an enormous mosque on the last unspoiled hill in Istanbul, which will have I mean, a capacity of 30,000, and of course, a shopping mall underneath, if anybody can ever get to the thing. Um, and I think his idea is to do, you know, that where Kemal Ataturk got rid of Mehmet the Sixth, he will get rid of Ataturk, but I doubt whether it's manageable. I really do, because the you know the, the creation of a of a middle class is is un, and plus there are all armies of people, ordinary people, uh, the Alevis, who a lot of Kurds who simply wouldn't wouldn't want to put up with it, and they're being cautious so far. I, th I think uh, I mean I, I I think the problem what to do about the Ataturk. Uh, um, mementos, is the wrong word, uh, is pretty considerable, but um, any, so any alternative just seems to be so difficult, it's best to leave it alone. And while we're on the subject, you know, you, you've probably been in the Ataturk Mausoleum in Ankara. It's quite good, isn't it? It's not a bad one. I and mean, these things are usually not in the best of taste. Witness les invalides. But um, I think that one works. And he was a great man. From the Central European University, and thanks for the thought-provoking uh, discussion or talk. I have a question. You barely mentioned the Gezi Park protests. 
And you, do you think it's also a threat for Erdogan? And do you think it can happen that because I have an idea, I don't know if it's true or not, I'm, I'm asking you, I think that the Gazi Park missed the opportunity to bring the Gazi Park middle class people together with the Kurdish uh, side. And do you think it can happen that they find a common ground uh, against somehow the, the, the political Islamic movement? And I'd, I'd, I'd have to say, I just don't know. Uh, I really don't. You know, the, the problem with uh, the Gezi Park thing was, it had an air of 1848 about it, you know, that all the, all, like the Arab Spring, in effect, that, you know, all the good guys like you and Brunus in part me will be there and all the bad guys will be on the other side. But then, uh, you know, there's the, well, Garibaldi said it, the peasants aren't with us. Everybody else is, but not the peasants. And that was the trouble with Gezi, that they, it's, it is that group of, I agree, I was entirely on your side, but uh, it's, it, it is isolated in the towns. Fortunately, it's big enough not to be swamped by people from Kayseri or whatever. Uh, I, you know, the, I'm afraid you've asked a damn good question. Uh, is it possible to get an alliance of this sort of thing with the Kurds? And I just don't know. I know that, I mean, friends of mine, old students who were in the Gezi thing, said they really admired the Kurds because they knew how to deal with charging police. <laughs> but I, there's not much love lost in the end. Uh, I, and, and, you know, I, I, I mean, to my vast regret, I hear that, for instance, in Hajatepe University, the, the tension between Kurds and Turks is pretty high. I mean, I, I, I'm an old-fashioned brotherhood of people's man myself, and I don't like hearing this sort of thing, but I hear it. I'm, I'm Clara Vittol. Um, Turkey forged ahead economically as a secular democracy, but now it seems that religious observance is gaining ground. So if you think in the long term. Do you think that this development might have an adverse effect on the development of the economy or at least um, slow it down, affect it in, in a negative way? It's a very, very good one, that. Um, you know, I, I do think that if, um, uh, I mean, all countries have an element of hand washing hand of, um, I mean, sometimes called crony capitalism or what have you, all countries have that. I think with it's, it's particularly dangerous in, uh, if you do, if it's done in a religious context where uh, the, uh, the economy is run by, uh, well, religious elements. I mean, for instance, I've, uh, since I've been preparing to write a biography of Andrashi, I've been looking into mid-19th century liberalism and the way in which political Catholicism developed in that period, specifically with Louis Napoleon. Um, and you find that, you know, compare the Prussian economy with the economy of Second Empire France and it explains 1870. Uh, the, it, it is, I think, quite dangerous if a country starts bending laws. And you can see it's happening in Turkey all over the place now. Uh, uh, I can see it where, in my university, girls who really couldn't care less about it start covering up, start pretending. And a dead hand of hypocrisy and conformism descends on the place. Uh, it is obviously economically very dangerous indeed when that happens because you can't trust the system. And trust is the basis of any kind of successful economy. It has to be. And I think that one's dangerous. And I can see, you know, warning signs uh, all over the place. You can see it in um, 
in the way in which Istanbul has been ridiculously overdeveloped with concrete buildings where they don't belong, where the town planning system is obviously out of control. Uh, of course it's dangerous and should be stopped. Um, what a good question. Oh, uh, 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 has the American influence been benign, helpful? Well, uh, I mean, I'd have thought, it's, I'd have to say, I think the Americans are absolutely splendid as foreigners in Turkey. I notice the way they adapt. The British, I'm afraid, nowadays just become hopelessly insular. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know their, their knees tremble as they pass the kebab van in the high street. <laughs> and, and they, but the Americans have been very good. Uh, American influence in Turkey, well, uh, you know, leaving aside the standard things about, uh, you know, Coca-Cola and the, um, which, about which many of us would have obvious reservations. Um, in general, the American influence has really been enormously positive. It's been a, a, a Turkey's joined the modern world and uh, 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 tens of thousands of Turkish students go to America every year. Now, uh, having said that in general about America, um, when you come on to specific American acts, then I think the Turks, to say the least, raise an eyebrow. I remember when, um, when, the, when the Iraq war happened, uh, I sort of generally supported it on sort of general grounds. And all Turks, without exception, said, this is crazy, uh, in which they were right. And, uh, <coughs> um, you know, the modern American politics, it's, it's causing a lot of unpopularity for America. Whether it really matters, I'm not sure, but it certainly is, no question of it. These American blunders over Afghanistan, Iraq, oh dear, dear, <clears throat> dear, dear. Thank you. I am from Bulgaria. And, uh, you know, the power of the Turkey is very important for us. So we have... Of Turkey yeah. is very important for Bulgaria. Plus having in mind, you know, last very well developed Bulgarian policy to lose all the chances to build a, a gas pipeline through Bulgaria. If you know, it was called a blue stream. Now, because of this Bulgarian good policy, we lost everything. And that uh, gas pipeline will be going to, will be built through Turkey. Turkey, Greece, Macedonia, Serbia, Hungary. So uh, we know that at the moment, uh, with the Russia assistance, including financial, in Turkey have, have been built or will be built two nuclear power stations. So it's, you know, again, uh, comparing uh, Turkey 20, 30 years ago, when Bulgaria was importing gas, um, sorry, power to Turkey, now we're supposed to buy from Turkey a power, uh, <coughs> plus the sanction uh, period where Turkey becomes quite a strong partner to Russia. So my question is, what is your opinion? How powerful could become Turkey in this situation in between two friends offering something or nothing or whatever? It's a very complicated issue, but well, I think it's a very crucial and no, very it's, sensitive it's issue, uh, particularly for this yeah. region. Hungary is a little bit uh, yeah. aside from, the, yeah. from what happens there, but definitely a lot of things happen in Turkey. I mean, I'm not entirely joking if I say that the answer for Bulgaria might be to secede from the European Union and, and, uh, re and make some sort of arrangement with Turkey. I think the same might be true of Greece, for instance. But as the country gets bigger and more important, more successful, its immediate neighbors in the Balkans might find uh, you know, closer association all the better. I mean, Istanbul's got lots and lots of people from the Balkans, including Greeks. And if you take, uh, if you, the most ridiculous thing I know about the Greek economy 
is the position of these Aegean islands. The you know, Rhodes, the biggest of them, but there's Kos and Leros and all that. They're supplied by electricity and water from the Greek mainland, and they're about, you, you could swim to them, practically. Um, and and they, they, they don't get supported in any way by Turkey. And this is a ridiculous artificial situation. Um, and in many ways, it would be better as Turkey grows. Why not get back to something, these old arrangements in the Aegean? Or the, the Black Sea, it does make a certain sense, because unquestionably Turkey's coming back as a serious place. Um, and if I were, you know, if I were a you know, poor old Bulgaria, losing people to Western Europe as we talk, it's an awful sad thing, this sort of thing, Greece. Uh, maybe there is a Turkish alternative, if maybe there is. I'm only speculating. Uh, uh, thank you very much. So, uh, yes, I think Turkey is, is coming back and it's really growing uh, hard, but I still see quite a lot of, of uh, well, uh, 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 question marks on, on the on the future, both uh, economically and also politically on the on, on the Turkish uh, development. So uh, politically, we see that this uh, uh, well, this uh, turn from democracy towards a more authoritarian uh, regime is is questioning not only the uh, political system and the belonging of Turkey to the Western world and how much they can uh, join it, but also the economic developments in Turkey, because we know that if there is an authoritarian system, how much it is, uh, it is uh, well, affecting also the economy if there are also, uh, so the, the regulations are constructed to, to support the regime, and then it's not so much uh, helping uh, competitiveness of the country, but rather the, uh, the, 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 the uh, so the uh, sustainability of the, of the existing regime. And also economically, Although Turkey is, is strong, but it's still very much dependent on quite a lot of... Uh, so in, in the last years, we have seen that Turkey wanted to make a, an eastern opening as well. So it was too much depending on the European economy. And with the crisis in Europe, they wanted to, to uh, well, uh, find new markets in Russia, in, in the Middle Eastern countries. Uh, and they, what we can say that Turkish economy is quite competitive and, and uh, the different construction sectors and, and also uh, in, in machinery, they have quite uh, uh, competitive products. So Turkey was successful, but it's turned out that these markets are not as safe. Maybe Europe was in a crisis, but uh, uh, if we see on Russia, uh, yes, Russia have no crisis, so it's not so easy to, to sell products, also uh, due to the sanctions, uh, Turkey is in a good position, but with the exchange rate uh, uh, changes, uh, it's not uh, so uh, good business to sell uh, products, and, and the demand is also decreasing in Turkey. If, uh, in, in Russia, or if we see Iraq or Syria, that became also very important markets in the last years for Turkey. Here as well, there are turmoils. So it is not so easy to find alternatives for the European Union for Turkey. So Tur we can say that Turkey is still uh, by Europe, and Europe is still, in many ways, the engine for, for or the most important uh, anchor for the Turkish economy. So I think that, yes, maybe Europe have to uh, realize that they need Turkey. But I think Turkey has also have to realize that they have to, so it's not so easy to make an independent policy and make uh, something uh, totally different. So they have to make a smart policy, which is uh, making their position in the region uh, important, a kind of hub, but with uh, strong relations with Europe, with Russia, and with Middle Eastern countries. In that case, it remains to me to thank all of you for your patience for coming out. Like me, you thought it was worthwhile. I certainly did. I must thank uh, Marte Botas for making this lecture possible this evening. He's the dean of this university, and we hope to make a return visit. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, uh, Demsh uh, Sigurvari for his, his, his comments, uh, and most of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, I'd like to thank Norman Stan for uh, a talk that was without a single cliche in it, uh, delivered without a note, uh, witty and uh, entertaining in the best sense of the word. Thank you very much.